Father, we give you thanks for this morning. Thank you that we can come together as the body of Christ, together to worship you freely, approaching your throne, communing with you. What a privilege that is. Help us to see the value of the church. Help us to value it like you value it. I pray that you would take your word now this morning, plant it deep within us, grow and fashion us and shape us more into the image of Christ so that we look like Christ as the body of Christ in how we live and operate and, and interact and commune with each other as we worship together. We long for that day when we will do it before your face and with the whole body of Christ, the people of God. I pray that you would protect my words and guide me as I speak from your word. May you continue to, to teach our hearts and train us and shepherd us. And we pray all this in Christ's name, amen. I'd be curious to know how many of you follow intently or follow passively, or maybe you don't have any interest at all in the Summer Olympics. It's kind of hard to miss it. If you turn on the, the news at all, you're going to see highlights. If you go to Facebook or some other outlet, some platform online, you're going to see headlines. I enjoy it. I enjoy watching it. I don't keep up with it as much as I used to. It depend, I guess it's just the, the busyness of life. And, but I, I, I like the whole range of sports. I love the professionalism, the, the skill that's, that's presented and, and demonstrated as these players participate. I particularly like and enjoy watching not just the single sport, sports and competitions, but the, the teamwork that is involved with a number of sports that are, that are being played in the Olympics. Such, such would be uh, rugby or softball, basketball, soccer, volleyball, water polo, uh, field hockey, badminton, tennis, others would be added to this list. But one I find particularly fascinating, and maybe not entirely more enjoyable than the others, would be the sport of rowing. That's not to say that the others aren't as enjoyable. In fact, I don't find rowing all that exciting to watch, per se, but I find it fascinating, and I still find it entertaining. And there's a reason for that. It's because as you watch rowing, you can't help but see how all eight rowers, and then you have the guy in the back, so nine team members, have to be 100% in sync with each other. They have to be perfectly harmonized. They are operating at the peak level of their physical abilities in order to get a chance at winning this prize, the gold medal, for their country. There's no room for apathy or selfishness. There's no room for disagreements or squabbling or, or resentment. All that is put aside. All their differences, their political views, their religious views, all that is set aside to achieve one thing and to work together as a team. These oarmen are disciplined, they're committed, they're focused, they're, they're unified. They trust and depend upon each other, moving together and operating as a single body, as it were. These team members, uh, they, they sleep, they eat, they train together for a solid eight months before the Olympics. They come together as fellow citizens of one country, right? They, they represent their respected country. They're, they're living, as it were, as a family unit, a single family unit, with one expressed goal. And here in our text this morning, the Apostle Paul presents a similar picture, and that is of the church here at the end of the chapter one that shares a common citizenship, a common heritage, a common purpose and goal. Let's read this text again. It's short. Verse 19 through 22. Paul says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints 
and are God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, just for the sake of recap, as we look at chapter 2, verses, or particularly this, this last section of chapter 2, starting at verse 11, you see in those those first uh, few verses, 11 through 13, this um, contrast between the Gentiles' former alienation with God and, and now them having been brought near because of Christ. And then 14 through 18, you see last week where, where Pastor Rory dealt with Paul's hymn to Christ, so to speak, as, as the bringer of peace in order, in order to bring about this reconciliation, and accomplished this change for the Gentiles to be included. The cross of Christ has canceled the hostilities. And then we come to verse 19 through 22, which completes this section by it summarizing with three metaphors Paul uses. Verse 19 summarizes and elaborates on the earlier contrasts that Paul spoke about that leads into a depiction of the church and the Gentiles in terms of a building, a temple, a dwelling place for God. Paul says earlier in the chapter, at the very beginning, he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love in which he has loved us, made us alive together with Christ. And because of this, Christ brought peace by bringing us near to God, where we experienced vertical union, and with that we experience horizontal union with one another. Paul begins verse 19 then with the so then, calling to our attention all that has taken place as he describes, as he described in chapter 2. What the gospel has accomplished is now being fleshed out here. Paul's showing us what this looks like with these metaphors. He's demonstrating what difference this should make in the life of the believer, but more specifically, what difference this should make in the life of the church. The unity that the gospel provides insists that we must be part of this new community. All this is a significant outcome of the transformation that has taken place, and we now see what this means for the church locally and at large. We're going to talk about this as we move through the text. The local church and the universal church, the church as a whole. And what God's purpose is in all of this. Christ brings unity, which is the distinguishing mark of a Christian, but more specifically, it is the defining mark of the church. And so as you, as, if you have your handouts there, you can see that the key truth that we're going to be looking at, that Paul is communicating here, that I believe he is focusing on, is, is this. The transforming work of Christ brings unifying change. And Christ provides three unifying realities that must govern our Christian walk. And we're going to look at the first one here this morning. We live together... We live together as fellow citizens of God's kingdom. We're fellow citizens. We, we, need, to, we need to pick up on this idea here of this togetherness idea. He's, he's going to be emphasizing this later on in the, in the text, uh, verses 21 through 22. We could spend a lot of time talking about what this means to be citizens together in God's kingdom in terms of how it should radically change our our priorities, our outlook on life, um, our decision-making, our passions, our affections. But Paul's emphasis here is on union we have with Christ, which is accomplished through the work of Christ, through the Spirit. And, and, it's, and it's what God intends for his people to have. There is... An entity, as one author puts it, there is an entity we, we once were not a part of, which is the kingdom of God, but now we are 
No longer strangers or outcasts or aliens or sojourners. We share in all the rights and the privileges of God's kingdom. And that's what Paul is describing here. We share in the rights and the privileges of God's kingdom citizens. What Paul has been arguing all along here, regardless, regardless of our past condition, regardless of our status, our ethnicity, we are all fellow citizens together in God's heavenly kingdom. Philippians 3.20 speaks to this, where Paul reiterates, our, citizen, our citizenship is in heaven, which we eagerly wait for, he says. There's, there's no second-class citizens here. We are all one. We are a new race. We are citizens together, anticipating the kingdom where we belong. Paul here says, in verse 19, says, so, so not, no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. With the saints is referring to all believers, God's um, universal church. The, the union and bond we have with the church at large ought to, ought to be seen in how we relate to one another locally. Think of, um, think of those Olympian athletes competing alongside one another. What brings them together? Well, you could talk about their love for the sport, perhaps. But no, what brings them together is, or, or perhaps their skill, but what brings them together is their nationality, who they belong to, what nation they belong to, or you could say what kingdom they belong to. It doesn't matter their politics, their preferences, differing worldviews. They all come together and work as one. They see each other as the same. They share in one common interest, and that is to represent their country well, right? This is the idea that Paul is emphasizing here. But he doesn't stop there. It, it gets even better. Not only are we fellow citizens of God's glorious kingdom to come, but we are family members in God's household. Herein lies the second unifying reality that ought to govern how we live. Number two, we commune together as members of God's family. We commune together as members of God's family. Paul says, so then, you're no longer strangers or aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Paul seems to proceed here in logical flow and thought while continuing with these metaphors. Yes, we are united in a national way where we no longer are defined by our ethnicity, such as, such as a Jew would be, or a Gentile, all of that doesn't matter anymore because we are together citizens of something far greater, something that is eternally meaningful and lasting. Your credentials, you could say, are, are when you are born into the family of God, when you trust Christ and his finished work on the cross, you could, you could say your credentials are stamped, your passport is verified and confirmed, and you are part of God's kingdom, right? But here, here he's saying you're part of the family also. There's an intimate level here. There's a bond that is secured, and that is a reality that we are to be living in light of. We are to commune together as members of God's family. Growing up in a large family, we had lots of differing viewpoints and and differences and squabbles and infighting, perhaps. Well, certainly, uh, you just ask my parents, I'm sure they'll give you all the stories. But when it came down to it, when it really mattered, we, we truly did love each other as siblings. We truly did support and, and have each other's backs when it mattered. When there was a, you know, a, a smaller sibling or a younger sibling that was in trouble, right, or, or perhaps sick. We, di we didn't take that opportunity to pick on them or to harass them or to take their toys. You know, we had their back. We supported them. We loved them. Or if they were getting picked on at, 
at the playground or perhaps by you know some kid at church that um, needed some discipline. You know, we had each other's backs. We supported each other. We were made even stronger as siblings through a few things. And I would say, and, and you could certainly relate perhaps with your families, but I would say simply the idea of communion. We commune together. We live together. There, there was togetherness happening, appreciating each other, serving one another. And a lot of times that had to be fostered and, and, and guided through, you know, our parents. That wasn't voluntary all the time. Confessing sins to one another, singing, you know, doing devotions together as a family. That's, that's important. Singing together, praying together, reading God's word together. Our bond would only strengthen through those disciplines, through those actions. And the differences we expressed had no chance in driving a permanent wedge between us because our bond was greater than our differences. And I guarantee you, there's, there's families that do it better than, than, than we did, for sure. But the idea still is there. The family bond we have with each other as a church ought to be so much stronger than any other family bond that you may have experienced or that you are experiencing currently. Because our bond is in Christ. We have been brought into the union with Christ, into his body as believers. How did this happen? Well, how, did, how did this come about? Well, through the cross work of Christ and through the baptism of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 13, let me just read this for you. Paul says this, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, th though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. We are all brought into one body. The Spirit has united us together to Christ in his body and consequently to each other. We're born again into the family of God, into the body of Christ. As such, the family union, this bond in Christ, is immovable. It's grounded and it's secured in Christ. And this is what Paul is going to get to in verse 20, where he says, Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone. Now, verse 20 reveals the implications of these first two realities that ought to govern us, this, this idea of living together as citizens of God's kingdom, um, communing together as the members of God's family. And so here he's, he's proving the unity that Christ provides so what's, what's, this, what's this foundation here that he's talking about? What's going on here? Well, there are different views here based upon how you interpret um, this idea of the foundation being of the apostles, this genitive here. Some see the apostles functioning as the subject of this verbal idea. So they're the ones doing it. They're, they're laying the foundation. Um, but it doesn't seem to square with what Paul is doing with, with the metaphor. It, it, if, if you take it that way, then Christ is both the foundation and the cornerstone, and it doesn't seem to be in keeping with, with, with what Paul is doing. And there's some, there's some grammar and syntax that kind of doesn't quite jive with that interpretation. Others read it as the foundation which the apostles and the prophets constitute, the divine inspired teaching of the apostles. That's the foundation. But in either case, I believe the point Paul is making here is, is twofold. And it's summed up in this way. The foundation of the apostles and the prophets is an important part of Paul's attempt to give his Gentile Christian readers a strong sense of their identity as part of the church. It points them to the roots, to the source of the normative teaching that is necessary if they are to not be confused or shaken by erroneous ideas. I think that's the first reason he says this. And then secondly, it is to uh, reaffirm their relation, this relationship idea with, with all the saints, 
We were all built upon the same foundation. We were all grounded in the same teaching. You are one body with the Apostle Paul. You are one body with the Apostle Peter and with Timothy and with Titus. This genuine, there, there is genuine objective unity between you and those early church fathers. We experience fellowship with men like Irenaeus, the pastor of Leon's, who wrote against the first of the deadly heresies that swept through the church, such as Gnosticism. We have fellowship with men like Clement of Rome and Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, John Knox, Martin Luther, and I believe we even have genuine fellowship in the same body with men like John Calvin and Jacob Arminius, Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, George Whitfield, Charles Wesley, and you could go on and on. Paul is depicting here the church universal. And the unity that is found in the universal church, all the believers from Pentecost to the rapture, is the same unity that ought to be true with the local church if, in fact, we have been joined into one body with, with all our former ethnicities removed. It's union with Christ that makes us one. That's the new race. That's the new humanity. That's the new family in which we are communing with, that we are in. Paul then shines the spotlight directly on Christ by using the emphatic pronoun combination here. Jesus himself being the cornerstone of this structure. Now, just like with the foundation of, of the apostles, there's differing views on how you take the cornerstone of Christ. I don't think they're very um, impacting or significant, perhaps, but I'll, I'll mention them nonetheless. Some take this as the actual stone that's laid at the corner of the building structure. It's the very first stone that is set in place to give orientation to the building. It's to ensure that the structure is built securely. Others see this as the keystone. They'll interpret that word as a, key, as a keystone, and there's reasons for that. Which, which would function as the, the decorative stone at the top of the building that also acts as the stone that keeps the arch in place that is at the pinnacle of the temple or the entrance of the temple. But in either case, I think Paul, Paul's point still stands here. Jesus is preeminent. He is necessary above all else. He's the most important feature of this building that Paul is describing. The imagery is, is so rich, and I particularly appreciate this concept of Jesus as the cornerstone who acts as the guidance for the structure being built. If, if the cornerstone is perfect, the building is going to be built perfectly square. The rest of the foundation, the apostles and the prophets, the teachings, the, the divine teachings, the inspired teachings of the apostles and prophets are going to stay true to that cornerstone as the foundation as they lay the foundation in those early years of the church. And I think, I think Scripture attests to that, clearly. And now we as believers have the opportunity to be built upon that kind of quality foundation. The cornerstone is the unifier of the entire building. That is what Jesus Christ is to God's kingdom. It's what he is to God's family and God's building. He is the unifier and if it's true that we are unified as one body with Christ and all the saints of old, so it must be true on the local level. It ought to work itself out with respect to our behavior, how we interact, how we commune together as a family. If believers have no distinction before God, they should have no distinction among themselves. We are fellow citizens and fellow family members, equal in every spiritual way before God. God sees us, and he treats us the same. He treats us like his son. If God accepts each of us, how can we not accept each other? That would, that would be the question to beg there. The death of Jesus accomplished that unity between us and the Father. He reconciled us through the justifying work of Christ by imputing his righteousness to us, breaking down the barriers of hostility. And the older I get, not that I'm very old, 
But the older I get and the more I read and study and learn and go to school, read journals and articles and textbooks and research papers, the more weary it becomes to witness the tedious, nuanced theological divisions and differences among theologians and church leaders and church members abroad. It becomes increasingly frustrating to witness, some, in some cases, the tearing down of one another and the separation that occurs and the divisions that are created because of nuanced theological differences. And I am, I'm not discounting the need for doctrinal clarity and guardrails, nor am I speaking exactly to the fundamentals of the faith, because that certainly needs to be in place. And we find unity in that. God's people find themselves dividing and picking sides and fighting over stuff that ought not fracture the church or the family of God, and thus undermining, really, and preventing the unity of the body of Christ. That which unites us is so much stronger than that which divides us. I was reminded by this quote earlier this week, or that truth. And when we allow our preferences and personal convictions and nuanced theological differences or even unresolved tensions in the Bible to, to divide us and disrupt the unity of the church, we are calling into question the effectiveness of what Christ accomplished and, and dismissing the very purpose and design that God intends for the church. This union together. No longer is it about the unity we have in Christ but it's of secondary issues. What, what I want, perhaps, or what I want to prove, and the church becomes very man-centered, and it becomes a broken, fractured institution. Do we really have a, that poor of a view and, and devalue the church in such a way? It's hard not to read ahead to chapter four, which, with respect to what Paul is saying here practically, Chapter 4, verse 11, he says this, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. He goes on, speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all respects or all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted together and held together by what, by, by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. This is how the family of God ought to operate. This is how the local church should be functioning. Communing together as a family, loving each other, despite differences, D discipling one another, investing in one another, praying for one another, coming alongside, reading God's word together, having each other over for meals, serving one another. This is unity. This is promoting unity that God intends for his people. Thirdly, the last reality that ought to govern our Christian walk is this. We grow together as a building for God's dwelling. We grow together. So we live together as citizens. We commune together as a family. And here we grow together as a building for God's dwelling. He says in verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place or in, into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. All this is happening for one express pur purpose, to grow and to be formed into the holy temple for God. This, this is continual action taking place here. The church uh, is, is a building that, is on, that has ongoing construction and expansion. It's con continually being added to and expanded and growing. It's what the Apostle Peter talks about in chapter 2 of his epistle, the spiritual st stones being built, to get, built up into a, a building, a spiritual building. A couple years back, I, I was returning from a study tour in, in, in Israel, and I had a layover in Barcelona, Spain. 
and I was traveling with another uh, fellow student from Central, and we had a, a lengthy layover. So we ventured out into the city, and we got to go see some of the sites, um, some of the some of the architecture. Barcelona is known for its its beauty and its architecture, its uniqueness. And the, one of the first buildings that we went to was a was a massive church, and you might be familiar with it. Um, if I'm pronouncing this right, it's it's the Sagrada Familia. And it's this huge church that's been under construction since, um, I'm not going to guess the year, but I, I, I read that it was 100, it's been under construction for 138, 39 years. It's the longest ongoing structure, construction project in the world, and it stands 560 feet high. It's just a really overwhelming, impressive structure that's being built here. And, and the contractors, the engineers, are having difficulty finishing this because the foundation was never meant to support necessarily um, the, the extent of which, or the height or the, the weight of the building. It just continues to be added and expanded, and, and there's, a, there's a whole story behind how it got to this point, but they're hoping to finish in the next few years. But it's, this, it's essentially the same idea that Paul kind of has in mind here, there is a continual growth taking place. It's, it's a beautiful picture to consider. But, Paul has to, but, but as Paul speaks about the universal church at large here, he is also including language that applies to the local church, and we addressed this briefly. Paul does not allow this picture of the church to remain in, in general terms here, but, but applies it to the Gentile Christian recipients of his letter as a, as a reminder of what they have become through their relationship to Christ. They, they need to be aware of the immensely privileged nature of their new situation here. In Christ, they are being built into the dwelling place of God himself. They are the bricks that are being built into God's new temple, like living stones. And yes, Paul has in view here the, the universal church, but I just want to take a moment and, and talk about this on a practical, applicational level. This idea of the universal church is certainly biblical and it's, it's supported and it's affirmed in, in scripture. Um, it's, it's mentioned, if I, if I did my study right, 16 times in, in the New Testament. More than half of those are mentioned in, in the, the book of Ephesians. But unfortunately, Due to a lack of spiritual maturity and, and biblical understanding, this, this idea of the universal church has led people to believe that that's the only membership that matters in our Christian life. The, the value and the appreciation for the local church is, is more optional, perhaps. And I would say nothing could be farther from the truth than what Paul is, is, is driving at here. That's not what Paul has in view at all here. That's not the purpose and plan for God, is to just to, to, to not be participating and, and members of a local assembly. And sadly, such an apathetic view of the church has, has really permeated many of God's people. And it's a, it's a growing phenomenon ever since the post-modernism era. Um, it, it has a reason for, you know, there, it's, it's a reason why there are such large surges of, of spiritual consumerism and entertainment that's being promoted, um, felt needs preaching, Pentecostalism, and, and charismatic, charismatic um, worship that goes on. But Christianity as a whole has, has recognized the lack of desire in, in the next generation to really attend and commit and be devoted to and committed to a, a, a membership, to a church. So that they have, they have busied themselves with marketing the church experience, right? I mean, we see that all over the place in our day with the attempts to compete with the secular culture. It's such a backwards way of thinking um, to be number-driven, to pander to people's comforts and, and bends, and, and they bend over backwards for their attention. And even those of us who are members are not immune to this. We too can have a faulty, skewed way of looking at the church, devaluing the local church and failing to appreciate the profound significance of the local church as, as if it's just a, a feature of our life or something that we do just on Sundays. But it's so much more than that. The rest of the New Testament 
speaks of the local church in dozens of places. You know, we could look at um, the authors of the New Testament where they're instructing the local bodies. They're encouraging them. They're greeting them. They're giving thanks for them. They're warning them. They're starting these churches. They're visiting them. They're, they're giving to them. They're providing for their needs. The New Testament also makes clear that the local church is God's planned place of participation. It's not enough that there are local churches. You have to be a part of this local church is what Paul is saying. Membership is assumed all throughout the New Testament, and it's explicitly stated in Acts 2 and in the early chapters of Acts. A few chapters later, or I should say in, in Acts 2 verse 41, he says, those who received Peter's message, they were baptized and added to the church. A few chapters later, here you have 5,000 men who were saved and added to the church. In chapter 6, they chose deacons, they chose leaders of the church. Um, there, there's, there's discipline that is in place. There's instruction to not forsake the assembly. All this is designed and purposed by God for the building up of his church. It all takes place on the local level. Take, for instance, uh, just this word being built up together. It's a compound word with a prefix that, that includes um, to, togetherness, with. It's more than just an individual experience. It's the process of being formed into the church as to take place in, in the company of fellow believers performed by God. The building together happens because the unity that Christ has achieved, and it's, it's what Paul expects of the local assemblies, the building up together. You can't do this alone. The, the major emphasis here in, in the in the use of this temple imagery here, is that our relationship, of the, is our relationship to the building of Christ, the, the church is constituted and functions only in relationship to Christ. It draws our, the text draws our attention to this in a couple ways. You can see that in whom, and then at the end of that in verse 21, in the Lord. So there's this close relationship to Christ. But also, I love the Trinitarian pattern here, where the, tri the triune God is emphasized. In Christ, a dwelling place for God, in the Spirit. So here you have the Trinity that becomes an example for us on how we ought to be communing and living together and unified. Our unity is a powerful example to the world. And God's grace overpowers the challenging differences of our former selves and brings us together as one race with one bond. When churches divide, they have the opposite effect. It impugns the very character of the Trinity, the, the very power and the integrity of the gospel. It costs something when we don't value the unity that God has planned for his church. This is what Paul is arguing for here. This is not me. This is, this is the text that is arguing this. The reality of men and women forming the structure for God's dwelling is dominated by the living power and presence of the Spirit here. You see that at the end of the, of the verse and elsewhere in, in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 especially. It is the Spirit who provides the link between believers on earth and the heavenly realm and makes the church the place where the heavenly and earthly dwelling places of God merge. God dwells with us. We read earlier that we have this ascension and communion with God through the Spirit. So what is the purpose of this temple? It's to give glory to God. That's the purpose of a temple. By whatever means God makes available to you, we are to give glory to God together. But notice the only way to accomplish this is by doing it together. The whole structure being joined together. We can't do this at home. You know, the saying goes, don't try this at home. That's the case here. The way Paul has designed, or the way God has designed his temple, it's for his people to be a part of it. And where, where does God dwell? He dwells where his people are. And they dwell together as a temple, being built up on the foundation of Christ universally and on a local level. God's plan for his people, his church, was never designed to grow and flourish in our living rooms, in front of the TVs. It's the togetherness of God's people where growth takes place. And may God help us to be governed by these realities.
that Christ has accomplished as we learn to live in union together as citizens, as we commune together as members of God's family, and as we grow together as a building for God's dwelling. Christ is our cornerstone, so let's continue to look to him and rejoice in the gospel that unites us. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. Thank you for the instruction of the Apostle Paul, calling us to unity, calling our, remem- calling our memories to the realization that you have accomplished this union. You have brought us into union with you through your spirit, through the finished work of Christ on the cross. We just remembered it and gave thanks for it and observed it at the table this morning. May this continue to unite us and to drive us forward, to compel us to spread the gospel around us, to live in accordance to the gospel, to unite around it. Father, thank you for this truth. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you that we are one and that we are complete in you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.